she was in the house at the time and woke up to the sound of two gunshots and came down to the kitchen to find her mother and her stepfather gone. Um, that, that was a really powerful experience for me and I appreciate the work that you all have done in putting forward the domestic violence uh, uh, legislation uh, because I think that that will have a critical impact. Um, but I would urge you to be as, um, as thorough as possible in eliminating the loopholes and the, uh, uh, the <clears throat> kind of wiggle room that is allowable in some of those situations because sometimes, uh, sometimes it, it is the, the gut instinct that tells you that somebody is dangerous and somebody has violent intention and um, I really think we ought to err on the side of human life in those instances as opposed to uh, pretending that the Second Amendment is something that we should hold uh, more dear than human life. Um, my best friend is a kindergarten teacher and she, um, she her husband has guns, her sons have hunted all their lives. Um, she's very familiar with guns, very comfortable with guns uh, in her home, um, believes that there's value in having them in her home for safety. Uh, but she's really troubled. Uh, she's really troubled by the fact that she is a kindergarten teacher. Her, her fondest wish for her students is to prepare them for first grade and to make it possible for them to, you know, to come to school, hopefully by the second or third day of school or maybe the second week of school without crying and clinging to their mom's legs as they're being dropped off. She is really disturbed by the fact that she also needs to think about as she's preparing for every school day, if there is a shooter and if they come into our building, I need to decide whether I'm going to go with my 15 or 20 kindergarten students into the bathroom and lock the door for an indefinite amount of time, or if possibly leaving the building through our exterior door is the safest route. And she said, I am really disturbed by the fact that I have that responsibility and that judgment, and I need to decide at the drop of a hat when I recognize that something is going on, I have to decide based on what I can see out the window of my classroom whether it would be safer for me to leave with my students or whether we should shelter in place. And I think that is just an awful, awful choice for someone to have to make. The fact that we have refused so far in this country to do anything substantial with respect to getting guns out of the hands of people with violent intent is really disturbing to me. And so I am so thankful that we are sitting here at this moment with the voices of students and teachers, with the voices of parents, uh, with the voices of, of community members all around us saying it's time to do something. So again, I know you guys are in the hot seat and I will support uh, whatever set of, uh, of reforms you bring out to us on the floor of the House, and I thank you for your work. Hi, Amy Sheldon, I represent Middlebury. Um, I don't have, I'm not going to try to, uh, there was some amazing testimony that you've already heard from our colleagues, and I, I guess the thing I'd like to add is that um, I am a, a hunter and a, and a gun owner myself, and when I first got elected, um, I went across the street to talk to my neighbor who has a, um, you know, Charlton Heston is my president, or what, I, I might get the name wrong, but anyway, NRA supporter, 20 guns in his house, and um, I said, Raymond, we need to talk. I said, I'd like, really like to talk to you about guns and, and how far apart we might be on, on um, preventing gun violence. And we went through all the issues, all the things that you're grappling with in this committee right now, and we, we agreed on everything. <laughs> and I want to remind the committee that um, responsible gun owners in Vermont also support the work that you're doing and want our children to feel safe in, our, in school and want us to um, promulgate common sense legislation that protects all Vermonters from people who um, otherwise shouldn't have access to guns either in the short term <clears throat> excuse me or the long term so thank you so much for doing this heavy lift for all of us I know it's hard 
work. I appreciate the opportunity to come in and testify. And I really just hope you'll remember that um, people on, on all sides of this issue are ready to act. And I think the time is now for us to follow through, listen to our, our children, um, and help them feel safe in school. Thank you. So then let's turn to the amendment that we have on our desk, 2.1. And do you want to bring up the, um, did you hear from Eric on the antiques? No, I think he's in committee. He's probably a non-sensitive shirt. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so actually, yeah. I wonder if we, uh, we did, I did add, reach out to David Cahill. Uh, to testify, yeah. and and it didn't look like we'd be able to figure out how to get it fit into the schedule. But I know you did send it. Yeah. Should I read that into the, or should I just tell everybody it's going to be posted? Um, so, if you want to read it, that's fine. We should. It, um, I believe it is posted. So it should have this. Or if it hasn't, it's going to be posted. It is posted already. Okay, so maybe we don't have to read it because it's been posted. I'm not happy to read it. We need to direct it, and then um, and then actually direct it from the here. So Martin, why don't you go ahead and do that, and we'll just hear from her. Well, we have her, and I'll find it. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Good morning. Sorry that I'm late. No so should I just start in? <laughs> Thank you, first of all, for waiting and letting me do this. Um, good morning. For the record, I'm Jessica Brumstead, and I represent Shelburne and St. George. I want to start with thanking the committee for taking up this very important issue and working quickly to hear testimony and make difficult decisions to protect our state. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak both as a worried parent and on behalf of my constituents that I've heard from through emails, letters, and at town meeting a couple of weeks ago. After the horrible events that happened in Florida, I couldn't help but want to come and talk a bit about how important it is that we protect Vermont's children's right to feel safe in school. We need to come together and do something. What happened in Florida almost happened here in Vermont, except for a tip from a citizen and excellent work by law enforcement. I have received many emails from constituents in Shelburne and St. George about the heartbreak we all feel for our national community. Many have seen the report that there have been 290 school shootings since the data began to be collected in 2013. We have a national problem that we can no longer ignore. I ran for office to make a difference and to stand up for what is right. I have four children that have been educated in Vermont's public school system. My youngest is a senior in high school. Students in his classes worry about loud noises in the hallway or out of the ordinary events in the building. When I was a high school student, a big test in algebra or the worry that two boys were going to have a fight over a girl at recess, that's what made my heart race. Not that someone might walk into school with an AR-15, pull a fire alarm, and start shooting at me. I believe the problem is multifaceted, and we need a comprehensive approach to address the issue. I support stronger gun safety laws, improvements to Vermont's mental health care system, and enhancements to school security. Stronger gun violence protection laws, like the ones contained in Senate 55, or H-55, sorry, <laughs> Um, which includes a provision related to the disposition of firearms that have been seized by law enforcement, an expanded background check requirement that reaches unlicensed or private firearm sales, and a 21-year-old age requirement for the purchase of long guns. I also support a ban on bump stocks, high-capacity magazines, assault-style firearms, and a waiting period for the purchase of firearms. I'm not supportive of eroding our Second Amendment right. But why does anyone need an automatic rifle or bump stocks? When the Second Amendment was passed, the guns were essentially muzzle loaders that needed gunpowder poured down the barrel and tamped. A pad was put in and a bullet to follow. After all this gunpowder was put in the breech, the hammer needed to be pulled back, and then you were ready to fire. You could fire one shot before going through that entire process all over again. That's very different. 
We also need to look towards gun safety and reducing gun violence. Efforts to make guns safer with trigger locks, requiring safe storage units equivalent to a child access prevention law, plus real limits on access to guns for people who are most likely to misuse them should be our immediate focus. It is, and I also just want to mention that I have, as I said, I have four children. Three of them are boys. They've all been through hunter safety. They all hunt. We have guns in our house. They're locked in cabinets. They're, we're very supportive of that whole piece of our culture. It is also time to find ways to help Vermont schools look at whether more security would help. My four children are six years apart, and their elementary school went from K through eighth. Hence, all four of my kids were in the same building for four years. After the shooting at, Col at the Columbine High School in 1999, my oldest daughter was in second grade. I was on the PTO, and I started working on locking the doors of our school. It took two years, but we were able to lock all the doors. Obviously, this... Time. By the time... Three of my children were in that building, and I felt a lot safer. We had to raise money through the PTO in order to do that, and so I'm hopeful that we could think about ways to help schools afford to do this to protect children. <clears throat> it's not perfect, but it's a beginning. After the shooting in Florida, I spoke with Adam Bunting, the principal at CVU, who told me they had begun a full-out process to look into securing the high school. I don't agree with arming teachers, but we need to seriously consider how can we help schools make the necessary changes to help keep kids safe. Okay. I was pregnant with my youngest son when Columbine happened. Sam was born eight months later. This has always been his reality. Shootings in our schools and playgrounds. After Sandy Hook, my son came home one day. He was now in sixth grade. This is the youngest. This is the one who's grown up. And he wondered if for thank you. Um, and he wondered if for a school project he could build. bulletproof closet for the kids to sit in when there was a clear the halls drill. He wanted his classmates to be safe. Last month, when the Florida shooting happened, he came home from school and talked about wanting to use a chair to break a window and get out when I fall. <laughs> Gosh, I'm sorry. No, 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 you're fine. You're fine. Um, and when a fire alarm goes off, students are scared and angry, and they are standing up and protesting what is right with signs that read, protect us, not your guns. Shouldn't we all take this national student effort seriously? Support, the second, support for the Second Amendment goes hand in hand with keeping guns away from dangerous people. Let us stop fighting about the Second Amendment and start doing something to keep our children safe. Thank you. Sorry. Sometimes I think I don't feel this emotional, and then I start remembering each of these inst instances where your child comes forward with his fear, and you can't protect him. Any questions? <laughs> The tax. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, this is um, uh, David Cahill's uh, email that he wanted me to, to share. Uh, I had the opportunity to review Mark Malone's proposed amendment to S55, including the high capacity magazine ban. There are valid arguments on both sides. Sportsman will point out that it only takes a second for a skilled shooter to swap out magazines. And for this reason, a magazine capacity manages a government intrusion without benefit. Conversely, gun control advocates may credibly argue that the same split second that it takes to swap magazines could be used by innocent victims to escape a mass shooting and also could be used to attempt to disarm the shooter. Balancing a would-be victim's constitutional right to continued life 
against the constitutional right of another to bear arms is no easy task. It is my professional opinion, um, and just for people who don't know, David Cahill is a state's attorney for Windsor? Or Windsor. 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 Yes. It is my professional opinion that a 10-round magazine limit fairly balances these competing rights, and if enforced, would it offer victims and first responders a brief window to act during a mass shooting incident. In order for this ban to be effective, it must clearly prohibit the offering for sale of high-capacity magazines, regardless of... They would use the federal definition, which I have here. If anybody wants me to read it at this moment. But. And so where where were you supposed to put that? So he actually the, he provided the, um, the amendment. It would just... Let's see where... It would just switch... Um, in uh, uh, number one in uh, the background check, so A1, page six. page six, it would, number one would say firearms shall have the same meaning as in sec subsection 4017D of this title. <coughs> as I say, that's the same thing. It's yeah. done in the minors, sale to minors section. Yeah. And so that way it would exempt the antiques. So did the folks follow that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, I think we meant to do that, actually. So, okay, thank you. All right, so, um, Luke, are you prepared to, to do a walkthrough? Sure, okay. sure. Thank you. And are you on the floor at 10 o'clock? Your time is pretty tight. I'm, I'm sorry, can you hear me? I think you're on the floor at 10, so your time is pretty tight. We, we are. Yeah. Could you go sure. through maybe, um, you know, beginning announcements and then we can... Sure. Uh, unless, unless somebody needs to be out there for... You know, for all the answers or something like that. Go ahead. Yeah, we have, I'm sorry, we have um, um, all three of the um, various um, Trim John Street Academy section of leadership teams here today, and I'm closely okay. introduced to one of them, so okay. I will need to be Yeah, there. Good morning, everyone. Luke Marland from Legislative Council. And I think the draft that all of you have in front of you, either in paper or on your iPad, has a new or changed text highlighted. So what I'll do is try to focus on that new or changed text, which is highlighted in yellow. If at any point anything's unclear, please stop me. On page four of this draft, and once again, as the chair indicated, this says draft 2.1 in the upper left-hand corner. On page four, you see that there's highlighted language on lines 10 through 12, and it talks about the um, proceeds from the sale, and it states that they will be allocated to a municipality to the extent needed and used to offset the cost of uh, storing non-evidentiary firearms. So I believe that's something you've discussed. I think that language is clear, but it states how the proceeds of sale should be used. Are there any questions about that? Uh, proceeding then to page seven, at the very bottom of the page, on line 19, you'll see that the phrase was added in, shall not be considered a vendor. And I believe that is based on discussions with, um, well, based on discussions to exempt from sales tax. That uh, language may need to be a little bit fine-tuned, but that's the intent of that phrase. Proceeding now to page nine, you'll see that there's a, uh, a number of sections that are new. So the first one is on page nine, lines four through eight, and it states that a licensed dealer who facilitates a transfer pursuant to this section shall be immune from civil or criminal liability for any actions taken or omissions made when facilitating the transfer in reliance upon this section. Um, it also states that this subsection shall not apply to reckless or intentional misconduct by the licensed dealer. In other words, if the FFL is facilitating the transfer of sale, doing the background check, he or she will be immune from civil or criminal liability unless he or she is, quote, reckless or intentional misconduct. I think the intent of that new language is obvious. It's a carve out and uh, protects from civil liability or criminal. So, so if we're going to be seeing uh, another version of this, would it make more sense for that section to be uh, subsection C4? Because C, uh, subsection C really deals with the license dealer and the responsibilities and the like. It's a, you know, just a matter of 
continue to work. Uh, I'll work pass out. on your suggestion. Yeah, um, no, sometimes, cool, sure, I'll pass it on. Sometimes, like that, the car out at the very end, big, okay. it comes in everything, but I'll pass it on. Okay. I'll, I'll leave that up there for you. Okay. Thanks. Any other suggestions or questions? Uh, going further down the page, uh, these are changes to what was um, subsection B and what would be the new 13 VSA 4020, which is the age limitation. So this is the carve out the section that states the section shall not apply to one law enforcement officer, but deletes the language that used to focus that on a purchase for purposes of his or her duties. So if you're a law enforcement officer, you're exempt. And then if you're an active or veteran member of the Guard Reserves or active duty military, you're exempt. So once again, it's taken out of the prior language that had to do with uh, purchasing for purposes of your duties or responsibilities. So it's broadening those two carve-outs. Going on to page 10, any questions about that? I'm, I don't go in very quickly. Uh, on page 10, you see a new five. The, a person who provides the seller with a certificate of satisfactory completion of a firearm safety course. So you have the language from previous drafts that's a carve-out or exemption if you've taken the hunter safety course. Then this would also provide a similar car or exemption if you've taken a n another satisfactory uh, safety course, but that's not defined. I think that is a topic for discussion for this committee. What types of courses those would be, or who determines that they're satisfactory? So that's a work in progress. Did you find out anything about that? No, and I, the more I thought about it, the more difficult it seems outside of the. Uh, to find that in a way that we're not asking the FFL to make some determination that they may not be in the position to make. But anyway, so no, I haven't made any progress on how to do that. Should we talk to the Department of Public Safety to see if they're the right? They may be the most obvious of the. To approve certain ones, or right. We can ask. Yeah. Proceeding on to the large capacity ammunition feeding device section. It now will say that a person shall not manufacture, possess, transfer, offer for sale, purchase, receive, or import into this state and then it continues with the language you've seen before. So it broadens the prohibition and includes import into this state. So that, can I interrupt that? We sure. the Cahill concerns about internet sales in the paper? I believe that was the intent of it. Gotcha. Um, it is not focused, yeah, it would offer for sale or import into the state, yes. And, and he saw this language before he sent that email. Great. So, so, so Luke, my, my question is, actually not related to, a, it's related to that sentence or that right. section, but I had um, somebody ask me if given that it says a person and we consider corporations persons yes. under certain, if that's going to create um, any conflicts that need to be carved out. I understand that you want this to be broad, right? So I, I don't believe so. In other words, okay. it would uh, include a living, breathing individual, you are I and a business or a corporation. So if you want it to be broad, I don't think that's an issue. I don't think that's a conflict. If you want it somehow limited to just a business or just a living, breathing person, then you would have to do that in some other way. Thank you. Proceeding to page 11, on the top lines one through four, in C, the language states, a prohibition on possession of large capacity ammunition feeding devices established by subsection A shall not apply to a large capacity ammunition feeding device lawfully possessed on or before the effective date of act. So this is the grandfather clause we talked about previously, and what is deleted is possession or transfer. So this grandfather would apply to possession, transfer, or anything else pertaining to that device before the effective date of this act. And line five, this section shall not apply to large capacity ammunition feeding device, and then it has other carve-outs um, 
Was shell a new word? I have not. I don't it know. Was a typo. Yeah, all right, that's, I assume that it meant to be shell. Okay. And I don't believe there's any other changes. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you explain that sure. thing again? Please? Sure. So it, it, you have to read it in conjunction with uh, the language I read earlier under A. So A now states that person shall not manufacture, present, transfer, offer for sale, purchase, receive, or import to the state, mm -hmm. basically the large capacity magazine. And then now C states that the prohibition on possession um, shall not apply to a large capacity ammunition feeding device lawfully possessed. So it's a grand father clause, but the words transfer was taken out. It's really focused on possession. So if you have in your possession prior to the effective date, your grandfather died. And then also what's not in the thank you, what's also what's not, it's not in this draft, um, the waiting period, the assault weapons ban, and the off-duty law enforcement. That's what we took out. And, and okay, thank you. Um, right. um, yeah. Yeah. So, right, in the bump stocks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bump stocks are the last, right. And safe storage is still, still in here. We were keeping that in here until we were from um, commissioner Jets. The only other thing I just would throw out for people's consideration is, is there any need, um, and Luke, I don't know if you have an opinion on this, about um, putting something in about honorable or dishonorable discharge. I have a feeling we covered that ground. There was a form that was issued, a DD something, but I just put it on the table as maybe one detail we didn't like, circle back to, and I don't know that they, we so, need to, but just putting it out there. Yeah, there's so, testimony. Yeah. So, so the background check, uh, one of the prohibited purchasers is somebody who has been dishonorably discharged under right. the federal law, which is essentially and I made a note about the firearms, uh, I'm sorry, anti-firearms issue. My sense of the, that that's the consensus of the committee, you want that to be cleaned up. So. Yeah, yeah, that was just, the, gotcha. we had talked about that before, yep. and I forgot to make sure that was in, in there, so. Any other questions or potential changes to this draft? <clears throat> Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you. So, it's storage. <laughs> well, so I mean, I believe that both, from all the things I've read, safe storage is probably uh, has the, the most evidence uh, that and background checks mm -hmm. for being helpful in certain uh, instances. However, um, I think the way it's drafted right now is that it's a little broad. Uh, and I've had some other ideas, but, um, and, and also, I will also say that the, the waiting period is another one that, that has a lot of promise to be very helpful, but, but didn't really seem to have enough testimony to really look at all the different facets of that one. That's why I had withdrawn that one, uh, and, and I would suggest, uh, Reluctantly, that that safe storage just needs more work, and it needs more uh, testimony. And and if we had, if, if I were given more time, and for whatever reason, if this isn't going to go out in the next couple days, uh, I would ask the, the to be able to continue to, to work on that. But but for now, I would withdraw it, withdraw that because I just think it needs. It's a little too broad, and, and I've been trying to figure out how best to to narrow it so that the bachelor in the woods is not worried about having this 22 by the front door, uh, but that it's it's really getting at what we're trying to get at. Bottom line, I, I would I would seek to withdraw it at this point. Um, but again, if things are delayed, I will be working on it uh, more. So. Thank you. So a few things. Um, one, I'm, I'm keeping the list as we talked about the other day. The governor is planning on, by executive order, creating a, a commission on, on gun safety and things to look um, beyond what's what's done this session. So certainly, um, if that doesn't get passed out of here or amended on the on the floor, I would think that the waiting period, safe storage, you know, some of these other things that we talked about would be something that that I could send in a letter to the to the governor. Um, and again, I'm trying to strike that balance between keeping 
55 is close to what it came over um, from the Senate, you know, as, as possible. So I, um, so I appreciate your, your wanting to withdraw it. Um, it is interesting that, that there is that duty for foster parents, right? Um, but anyway, but I, but I appreciate you wanting to withdraw it. Okay, Barbara. I mean, it, it, it I, I understand the complications and the need for more research on it. It does seem that we certainly try to pass a lot of laws that talk yeah, about keeping them out of sorry. hands, things out, dangerous things out of the hands of children, mm -hmm. including marijuana, tobacco, and I again think that if we think it's important enough for children in state custody to benefit from this, I don't know if a very narrow provision that says where children, you know, if there's a danger of children having access or households that have children, because it's, it's, it's we know it makes a big difference. And accidental child shootings are, are not, um, yeah, it, it just seems like that, I don't think that would be that controversial because people want children to be safe and it is a health risk. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think every, I mean, today, finally, look, I think everything in this bill is controversial. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, just I, think, I mean, I think we need to, um, yeah, I'm going to call on um, Tom because he hasn't, I, I saw your hand, but he hasn't spoken. But, yeah. um, Martin, I want to thank you because I, I know we're on opposite ends of the, uh, of the spectrum on, on this bill, which, which is fine. But I, I just want to thank you for being conscientious and, and pulling stuff out that you know, I guess you could say, isn't ready for prime time. And, and not just doing something for the sake of doing something. Um, and and uh, I mean, it, just so that it's, you know, it's done right in your mind. And because I, I think, um, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll look at it in my perspective, but you know, uh, you know, on the opposite end of, end of doing something just for doing something, I just don't want to be doing it. You know, it's just, just the way that, you know, uh, that I, you know, the way that I believe in the Second Amendment. And but, um, and then of course on the other end of the spectrum is there's some people that just want to do something for the sake of doing something. But but again, I just want to thank you for not doing something for the sake of doing something. And, 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 and doing it what you see as the right way. It's, it's, it is appreciated. It's not the committee process. Right. I, I have a lot of faith in the committee process. So. And then one of the other issues, I did look into uh, trying to figure out how to narrow the storage of uh, households that had children and such, but um, the opinion I got is that that might have some equal protection problems. And, and so it just kind of became complicated as I was looking for the ways of trying to try to narrow it to, to get at what you're talking about, Barbara. And, and it just needs more time. So. Um, everybody, I've got, I've just handed uh, Mike an amendment that I had drafted up last week. I am not going to try to attach it to this bill here because I'm going to vote no on it and I don't want to vote no on my amendment because it deals strictly with school safety. And so I'm going to try to find a bill over in the House Education to attach it to, but nonetheless, I want everybody to take a look at it here sometime after we get off the House floor. If we have a minute, I'll, I'll explain it to you what I'm trying to uh, propose here. And just to let you folks know, yesterday I spent the day uh, going around talking to various law enforcement heads, the uh, local state's attorney and the uh, superintendent of schools after they, after they read it and uh, I explained to them what I was trying to accomplish. They surprise, surprise, all applauded. So, uh, like it's again, I'm gonna. I want you guys to get your uh, get your say on this before I move forward to see what you think about it. But we'll do that, I guess, this afternoon when we get off the house floor. Yeah, is this similar to the school safety bill that Senator Sears has? Or I have no idea. Yes. I haven't seen Senator Sears' bill whatsoever. Right, so, so what I was gonna say, Jerry, if I, yeah, if I can, if I can, if I can get Senator Sears that language because they are doing a. Um, school safety bill and that's why the um oh the law enforcement we took that piece 
out that we had passed on um, on H765 regarding law enforcement. Um, do, do you what I'm, which one I'm talking about? Well, um, anyway, Mike's got it in his hand right now. Yeah, we'll, but we'll um, anyway, there was an amendment that, that it was Jansen's amendment um, to, to 55, and it was regarding um, law enforcement. Um, was it off duty or? Yeah, it's yeah, the off duty. The off duty. We touched right. on that last right. week. So, so that Senator Sears will um, will look at in this bill, and if I can bring him your this amendment. Is, the, the, this goes kind of way beyond. No, no, that. absolutely, but in, but it's in, but in it's school safety. It's yeah, school safety. Oh yeah, no. Right. But in a nutshell, um, uh, I'll just gloss over it. But in a nutshell. There is a, after 9-11, there was a federal law that came out. It's uh, 18 U.S.C. 926C, which allows retired law enforcement officers, let that be federal, state, local, countywide, as long as they meet a criteria of, uh, uh, of various things. You know, they have to be, uh, they have to uh, have worked in the field for so many years. Um, ended their career honorably, and uh, and if they meet all of this, they are allowed to go to like for me, for example, I am, I, I participate in this program where every year I have to go to uh, Pittsburgh, which is where the state uh, uh, criminal justice training council uh, academy is. I have to go qualify with my left weapon to show my proficiency. If you do that on a yearly basis, you're allowed to concealed carry in all 50 states. Well, there's some carve-outs in, in, in involving that, one of which is if you're uh, you're not, these people are not allowed to carry in a school safety zone, uh, gun-free zone. Well, this law will alleviate that where they will be able to. And what, what how I believe this thing should go forward is, in fact, I was under the false assumption that uh, there's SROs in every school in the state of Vermont. I was blown away to find out that that isn't the case because what I really saw this bill doing is augmenting public safety in these schools. Uh, when I found that, I said, whoa, okay. And, and the superintendent, John Castle up there, who used to be in your area as a superintendent, um, he said, well, Jesus is perfect there. I can hire these people as SROs. And so basically, <clears throat> What, some of the, there's a couple of reasons why we don't have SROs. There's a multitude of reasons why we don't have SROs in uh, in all these um, schools. Cost obviously is one. Um, um, the lack of re uh, lack of officers, trained officers, would be number two. But again, this 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 brings a whole another cadre of people into the mix. They're completely trained. They're readily available. They're cheap because they're they're all retired they all have their benefits they all have their uh they, they all have their pensions and everything so you know you'd be able to hire them relatively inexpensively i guess it's a good bang for the buck but it it it, it, it allows for a whole new level of safety inside these schools so that's what i'm trying to accomplish and we'll and there's i'm sure a lot more questions and there are answers and we got a long way to go because of uh the various um, uh, policies that have to be written, who implements them, who, who's in charge of these people, on and on and on and on and on. But this is just throwing it out there to see if anybody believes that this is a good way forward to uh, to make our schools safer, safer in the state. Yeah, no, thank you. It's, it's great. I, I will ask Senator Sears to consider it for the. No, I just wanted to say West Rowland uh, cut their SRO uh, last year uh, because of budget. Yeah. And, and, and I don't, maybe if it was, you know, half the price, you know, because, it, I mean, to hire a somebody from a, a department is got to be pretty expensive. And somebody who's just going to be supplementing a little bit of income, I got to believe, it'll be a lot it, cheaper. The way I look at it, fifteen dollars an hour puts a person in there. That's what was so going through my mind. So. Last night at the, um, we had a community forum with Senator Sears, Tom Anderson, and Rebecca Holcomb, and they mentioned I think about three million appropriation that's been asked for for school safety grants yep. to help do some of that, pick up some of those costs. Right. And it just went through my mind. You could probably hire two. 
for the price three. of one. I, I don't know what they uh, get for just, a, an SRO. Oh, but. I mean, it's, it's huge because you know you're talking basically of, of the full price of an officer, including Denny's and everything like that. You're talking bare minimum of forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, right. where this could be accomplished because they're only going to work when schools in session, and uh, yeah, I, to, to come into play of, of other things like. I've, I've been around the block a time or two. I very much remember 9-11 and the changes um, that took place after after what happened on 9-11. TSA was was adopted. We, we brought that brand new uh, agency in. Uh, we also um, <clears throat> Of all hardening of the uh, of the cockpit doors and everything like that, and uh, one of the things, <coughs> oh, and the most important thing was the additional hiring of thousands of additional uh, sky marshals. Well, it, it oh, basically within a year, it transfixed, transformed the safety of air travel to where today, you know, it, we wow, well, we haven't had another hijacking like that since 9/11. Um, but one of the things that uh, that the, one of the things that, that has always intrigued me about uh, <clears throat> about sky marshals is the fact when each and every one of us gets on a plane, we have no idea if there's actually a sky marshal on board or not. No idea. So and um, and and I kind of look at this program much the same way because we might not be able to put an SRO, armed SRO in every school, but but just the knowledge that they might well be there it, it will be a deterrent as far as I'm concerned, as far as school safety. So again, this is all in the in, in, in the initial stages here, and, and but I think it's some it, it's a way forward where we can actually put up put a check mark that we're actually doing something for school safety and the safety of our children. So. All right. All right. Thank you. Can I, just add real quick? I, I, I went through the um, federal definition about antiques pretty quickly. I just want people to, you should go and look at it. I just want to make sure everybody knows that it does include replicas um, as long as they haven't been converted to use modern ammunition um, and black powder. So those are in there. So everybody's on the same page. Are we going to have a discussion later about all this? Yes, we we, um, yeah, so I'd like folks to get back um, if we can, or if we have breaks when we're hanging around a lot, just trying to come back. Um, um, I don't know if it'd be, yeah. So we're going to produce a new draft. Is yeah. safe, safe storage out or out. maybe in? Out. South. Safe storage okay. out, the new definition of firearms, mm -hmm. and then was there a typo or an extra word that? Came up this morning. It was correct. It was correct. Yeah. So, um, so once that's done, Luke, if, if you could please um, either maybe send it to Mike to have to committee members, but hopefully we can, um, you know, have it while we're on the floor and and see it. Um, so. Yeah, I have a. Um, I think I mentioned this to maybe a week or two ago. I have a large manufacturing company in our county who manufactures and distributes firearms and has for gazillions of years. And that section of 4021 is really. Sorry, we have a large manufacturer, yeah. Century Arms. It's been around for probably 100 years. It's yeah. a big international company. And it's, it's got 200 people employed. Uh -huh. This would be, I mean, I've contacted them and them, given them copies of this. Yeah. I haven't really heard back one way or the other. Yeah. Maybe they could testify or call in or something. But, uh, section 8 on this new version is. In section 8. Large well, capacity ammunition being a out. person that shall not manufacture, possess, yeah. transfer, or offer for sale. For, I mean, their distributors, they, they sell all over the world. They sell, I mean, you know, they've been around for a long, long time. They have a lot of people employed. We've gone on tours and looked at all their stuff, and they've given us, you know, it's a major employer. Right, right. And I know a lot of people, when we talked about it a few weeks ago, I asked you to invite yeah, them. We haven't heard. Yeah. yeah, I haven't, yeah. you know, come, you know, they haven't come back with anything specific. I told them if they wanted to, you know, they could, yeah. I haven't heard my. They were sending it on to some okay. with the higher ops. So. Well, if they, if, you know, they can certainly, you know, email if they have any. Sure. Anything. But yeah, yeah. It, it was, we had talked about them coming in this afternoon, and then we hadn't heard back. Yeah, yeah, I so. haven't heard back either. So.